some energy production, right? Remember, it's a thioester, it's a high energy molecule, right? So, as the core N is coming off, this generates enough energy which will be able to allow addition of phosphate. The product is going to be succinate, but in the process, this phosphate will be allowed to attach to GTP and produce GTP. GTP has equal energy as ATP, basically. So this GTP would be counted just as much as ATP because this can be used to produce ATP. The end product will have no core A and it will be succinct. This here is succinct. Produce from succinct now for A. The enzyme here is actually referred to as succinyl CoA synthetase. Other books will call it succinyl CoA synthetase, while other books will call it succinyl CoA uh, thiokinase. So, whichever one you like is okay. Succinyl CoA Synthetase. Uh, just to remind you, you could have probably heard of enzymes called synthetase, right? Glycogen synthetase. And then here, I'm emphasizing the synthetase. You should know the main difference between a synthetase and a synthetase is that where a synthetase is, there will be production of a high energy molecule like ATP or utilization. You will see another synthetase when you come to beta oxidation. First reaction is catalyzed by fatty acid or a synthetase. It uses ATP. While a synthetase does not primarily use ATP directly. So that will be your end product. Here we said alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase remains complex. Right? Then the next reaction is the reaction you saw in complex two. This reaction involved Oxidation, not really oxidation, of course it is. Oxidation of succinate into turmeric, right? This reaction uses FAD as its coenzyme, and FADH2 is produced. This again is energy, just as much as this is energy, right? So you have FADH2 being produced. The end product, one hydrogen, another hydrogen has been removed from there. This is the same reaction in complex two of the electron transport chain which we talked about. And the end product is fewer. The enzyme, what's the enzyme? Succinate hydrogen is correct. Succinate hydrogenase. Then the next reaction is that this, allow me to move this a little bit so that it looks circular, right? This turmeric would then be hydrated with the help of the enzyme called tumorase. One hydrogen comes there, the hydroxyl group attaches here. End product is mallet D 
this is mallet and finally mallet will also be oxidized by an NAD linked dehydrogenase to produce oxaloacetate high energy there and the oxaloacetate which we had earlier shown is produced. Then the oxaloacetate combines with another acetyl for A and repeats the TCSI. There is the TCSI for yes. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, would you just speak up? Yeah. Well, they, when there's a malfunction to what? Production of okay, so you should note that it's not just mallet which will lead to production of the glucose. This would probably come from the particular intermediate which is produced. So you have alpha keto glutarate which is being converted into mallet. Then when we talk about gluconeogenesis, you notice that this mallet is able to cross the mitochondrial membrane. Although acetate, because it's highly charged and in this form, it cannot cross the membrane. So, mallet is able to move out of the mitochondrial membrane, get into the cytosol. You have cytosolic mallet, then the cytosolic mallet is actually going to be converted into back to oxaloacetate, then oxaloacetate with the help of phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase to be converted to phosphoenyl pyruvate. Then you produce your glucose. So, this mallet can be produced from oxaloacetate or from any of these intermediates. Is that okay? Now, what I want you to note is the fact that there is a lot of energy that is produced here. Right? You would see there is NADH there, another NADH there, there is another NADH there. Right? So you have three NADH molecules produced. At the same time, you have one FADH2 and you have one GTP. So you and I know this is like three multiplied by what? 2.5. One multiplied by 1.5 and this is just one, ultimately, this will be equivalent to 10 ATPs. Guys, you should know that if you use 3 there, 3 and 2 there, this will give you 12. Either of them is okay, just be consistent. You don't want to use 3 there and use 1.5 there, right? When you use 3, use 2 there. When you use 2.5, use 1.5, right? Is that okay? Now, one other funny thing is, which is something I'm going to come to when we talk about metabolism of fatty acids, is that you would notice that if a fatty acid has an odd number and the fatty acid has an even number, the fatty acid with an even number will have more energy. Fatty acid with 16 carbons compared to a fatty acid with 17 carbons. Fatty acid with 16 carbons will have high energy than the fatty acid with 16 carbons. And one is going to wonder why. The reason is simple. A 16 carbon fatty acid would produce seven molecules now. To produce eight molecules of acetyl 
right? From its reaction. While this one would produce seven acetyl CoA plus one propionyl CoA. And it's at the propionyl CoA where the energy reduction is. Remember, the eight acetyl CoAs, you know it's going to be eight multiplied by 10, right? So it will produce eight ATPs, roughly, right? Well, this with seven plus one propanol CoA will produce seven multiplied by 10, which is 70, right? Plus a propanol CoA. When you look at propanol CoA, propanol CoA will be converted into succinyl CoA, right? So it's like you're putting a succinyl CoA, and from succinyl CoA, moving upwards, how much energy is produced? It will be this GTP, that FAT, and that NADH. So this is 2.5 plus 1.5, which is 4, plus 1, which is 5. Do you get the sense? So the end product of the metabolism of a branch of, of an amino of the fatty acid with an old number is actually going to have the propanol copy which has less energy than an acetyl copy. Does that make sense? This is another question that I like asking in my assessment. And that's the explanation. Any questions, guys? Any questions? Any questions? Are we good? Yes? Sorry? Okay, so stereospecificity talks about the conformation that is going to have in terms of the shapes. In terms of, this is basically like, if you look at stereo isomers, right, there will be the D, there will be the L4. And you will notice that most of the intermediates that you're actually going to be producing are going to be in D4. So it's basically going to be D4 through and through. So that's what they are actually just talking about. So basically that. Any other questions? Before we put it to a close. I have an assignment for you. Go and read about the regulation of the TCA cycle as we always do. <laughs> Is that okay? Read about the regulation of the TCA cycle. I must tell you that you as students you will not be compelled at any point to draw these, um, these molecules, right? The purpose of drawing is to help you understand what is exactly going on. You can choose to write the names. I'll probably not even ask you a question such as illustrate the TCA cycle, right? We don't do that here. <laughs> probably ask you more decent questions about these things, such as explain why they can, you cannot produce uh, glucose from acetyl CoA. Sounds more interesting. <laughs> See what I mean? Yes. Uh, where does Citrate and isocitrate. Yes. You say first water has to be removed, then, then added back. Yes. Why can't you just do that? Well, so this is the way this yeah, this um this isomerization reaction occurs. I, I may mention that when water has been removed, there is a reaction actually here, an intermediate produced. When water has been removed, the product is called cis aconitate. Then cisaconitate is converted into isocitrate. So basically there is an intermediate which is not usually shown in most reactions. So it's citrate to cisaconitate, and cisaconitate into citrate, uh, into isocitrate. So this is why we said that dehydration 
rehydration. But most books will just basically show that. And the reason why I have to mention is because one would wonder why is this enzyme called a chronic It's because of that intermediate. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there could be some that may be hereditary, but I will give you examples of those that could actually occur as a result of effects of some drugs, right? <laughs> Classical example of this drug would be the drug which is used for treatment of in HIV patients. This drug called, I think I've mentioned this before, TDM, right? The not to stop This end, this drug is able to inhibit the enzyme in the mitochondria called mitochondrial DNA polymerase. Gamma. The consequence of this is that, apart from this, it will probably just inhibit the complex of the, of the electron transport chain, output is dysregulating the whole TCA cycle, energy produ production is actually going to be disturbed, and this primarily occurs in the proximal tubular cells and results to dysfunction of those cells. Dysfunction, depletion, and enlargement of those cells. So this is basically an example of a situation where you have something like a drug causing malfunction of the TCA cycle. You know, sir. Just one last question, sir. So, sir, it's a question. Sometimes the outer is made of the inner membrane. Sorry? Is it sometimes made of the membrane? Yes. Exactly. So where this occurs, in fact, this drug also causes malformation of inner mitochondrial membrane, cristae. Remember the cristae? It's actually, yeah. So it's, that's one of the effects. So it's mainly in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Any other questions, guys, before we put this to a close? All right, so guys, I think we're done here. Before this evaporates, go and make peace with it in the library and I'll meet you next week. <laughs>